Okay, so right now, my guest is uh, Caitlin Niblos. Caitlin is a first mate uh, for Captain Dave's a naturalist, a marine naturalist. She is a drone photographer as well as a um, photographer for us. And uh, she has been with us now almost three years. And I've invited Caitlin uh, to be with us today because um, she also is, uh, in my mind, a, a, a strong eco hero in that on her spare time when she's not on the water five days a week with Captain Dave's she does something very special and steps out of her comfort zone uh, she could be home on the couch watching something but she's not she's doing something so hi Caitlin hi thank you for being with me today so tell everybody um, what do you do on uh, every Tuesday yeah, every Tuesday I go to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center and I get to help take care of the sick and injured sea, li sea lions and seals that are being rehabilitated there um, and get to make them nice and healthy so they can go back to the ocean. Uh, and we really appreciate that. We love PMMC and we're Captain Dave's as supporters of PMMC. I actually just spoke at the Ocean Club a couple of weeks ago, which was really fun. And um uh, so, so tell us what that looks like. What does being a volunteer at PMMC look like for you? Like, do you have to um, get up early to do it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you don't, it depends on where you're volunteering. Cause there's a lot of different opportunities. I personally volunteer with animal care in the mornings. So I do have to wake up early and get there early. Um, uh, cause the sea lions need their breakfast, but, uh, um, yeah, so I, I go every Tuesday. Um, it's a big time commitment. Um, it's about a five hour shift every Tuesday and you have to kind of treat it like a job, even though it is volunteer. Um, but yeah, we show up, we uh, feed the animals, we clean all their pens, uh, prep the food for the next couple of meals, uh, help with any medical um, any medical things that are going on. We assist them in any way that they need. Um, and then if we're lucky, sometimes we do get to help with the rescues and the releases as well, which is really fun. That does look like so much fun. I mean, just, you know, being able to go rescue an animal and have the hope that you'll be able to, to you know, um, um, bring it to the place where, you know, it, it, it can be healthy again. And I know that a lot of the time they're just little pups, right? Yeah, we get a lot of pups in um, at the center. Uh, especially like, I mean, they come in for a number of reasons, but being uh, malnourished and dehydrated is a big one a lot of the times with the pups. Um, but it's, it is cool to, you know, watch them come in um, and then see them get healthy over time and then release them. And then even working for Captain Dave's, getting to see them out on the buoys, having a great time um, months, right. years later. So. Right, because they do get tagged when they've been mm -hmm. with you. And um, some of them have scars or some kind of a situation where, you know, the, you can tell right away, you know who it is. And um, for those who haven't been out on a trip out of Dana Point, there's a, uh, a buoy right outside of our jetty. And there's also a red whistle buoy. There's a green buoy and a red whistle buoy. And these animals love to hang out on them. And uh, we stop by and see them on our way back in, usually from every trip. And just check it out and see who's there on any given day. So, Caitlin, um, did you have to go to school to be a volunteer at PMMC? Uh, you don't have to go to school. I personally did. I got my bachelor's in biology and did some senior thesis work in the marine lab at my school, um, which is kind of what sparked my interest in starting to volunteer at PMMC. But you don't have to. Um, people from different uh, career paths volunteer there as well. Gotcha. So do they do training for you? Um, what does that look like? Um, you're, you're learning how to take care of the animals. I'm even now after being there for almost six years, you are constantly learning new skills. So it's kind of a learn as you go kind of thing. It takes at least a year to, to really start to like, know how to do everything, um, you know, from feeding to cleaning and boarding the animals and all that stuff. Cool. I have a question that I, um, I mean, I know I told you a little bit about what the, the interview would look like, but I have a question that I have not asked you and I'm surprising you with it. 
I have a, a hunch, and that is that um, all of us have this moment um, when we were kids uh, where we had this connection. Mm -hmm. Something happened with usually a wild animal, or maybe it was in a, a natural environment. Uh, maybe it was out in the forest or something like that, where you just felt like, oh, I, I, I feel connected here. And it there's a shift that makes you want to do something and care about the environment a little more, the animals a little more. Do you have something like that? Kind of. Yeah, actually it was at PMMC. I was a Girl Scout when I was, I was really young. I don't remember how old I was, but my troop went to PMMC for a field trip Wow! and we got to like practice rescuing a stuffed animal, sea lion. And, you know, I was holding the net and it was so exciting. And I remember getting to see all the animals in the pools. And I, uh, when I, we left, I said, I'm going to volunteer there when I'm old enough. Wow. So yeah, so I've been I've been planning on volunteering there since I learned about it. And you were about how old? Oh, I don't know, like maybe 10 or so. Wow. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. I did not know that story. So th that that's really cool that you brought that to life. Um quick story on um uh in the course of your volunteer work, what one sea lion or a seal kind of stands out to you uh, that you've had a connection with that you've kind of nursed back to health and, and released? Um, I think one of my favorites is a sea lion named Pretzel. Uh, I got to help rescue Pretzel and I named Pretzel. And then when Pretzel was at the center, um, while he he was being rehabilitated um they ended up removing one of his eyes i don't something was wrong with it but they ended up removing it and then he got released and he was doing really well and i actually got to see him out in the wild on one of our trips when i was um you know deckhand on one of the boats and i got to see him and you can see the little one-eyed sea lion sitting Aww. with all his friends i um, love it so, why yeah, did you I call really him pretzel that. I just he just seemed like a pretzel I don't know the way he was kind of like twisted up like a little soft pretzel so I love it I love it yeah. well so what would you recommend uh you're 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 a very experienced eco hero and certainly someone to to model after what would you recommend to somebody out there right now who um maybe they're 10 maybe they're a girl scout uh, maybe they're <laughs> maybe they're 25 and they haven't mm -hmm. you know gotten to that place yet I would say just start anywhere you can, even if it's not necessarily what you think you want to do, um, start there. Like I, even in college, like getting involved in um, any marine biology um, thesis work, like I thought I wanted to do something with, you know, sharks or something, and I ended up working with clams. And I, I really love clams now, but starting with that and then moving on to, um, you know, working at Ocean Institute and teaching marine biology there I didn't necessarily know that I was going to plan on teaching uh, students but like little things like that slowly got me to where I am now so even if it's not what you exactly planned to do um, try it out and maybe you'll make connections or um, you know you'll that'll actually be the route you're supposed to take I love it I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's a it's a, a gift to us that you're on the team and you are almost there with your captain's license. So yes, <laughs> yes pretty soon it'll be Captain Caitlin. So yeah. thank you again. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you out there. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Well, now I have Captain Gary uh, Bridgehouse with us, and he has been with us now for almost three years. And um, Gary um, has such a passion for the ocean and actually all things uh, animal and people. He's uh, one of our highly rated five star captains. And uh, Gary, you're you're a special guy um, because you didn't grow up. Um, you didn't go to school to get a biology and marine biology degree. And yet here you are out on the ocean doing what you do, incredibly knowledgeable about the animals. And you're an eco hero. Thank you. Yeah. So um, 
tell us in your spare time, you're out on the water five days a week, taking people out to see dolphins and whales. Tell us, um, what is it that you're doing in your spare time uh, to uh, qualify you as an eco hero in my mind? Yeah, um, that's easy to answer. So I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm an animal rescuer. I carry a dog catching pole in my car at all times. It's just what I do. I, I help animals in need. I didn't know how many animals would need help um, out on the ocean until I got started here at Captain Dave's. And I quickly saw the incredible problem of fishing gear entanglement for all of our animals. So that triggered my help the animals mode big time. And I just thought, you know, once they get entangled, a lot of times we can't save them because they can still kind of fly or the sea lions can still kind of swim. And I'm like, let me try to clean up the fishing line before it entangles them. So I started a um, little volunteer group. And once every one to two months, we go on the jetty here at Dana Point Harbor and collect discarded fishing line. And we get a giant bag full every time we go out. Um, so it's being proactive. Um, and while we're out there, we educate the fishermen on the proper recycling of that fishing line. That's awesome. And I do want to say that Dana Point is one of those harbors that's pretty special and that we do have these recycle um, bins on the jetties for the, the, uh, for the fishing line that gets broken or, you know, would otherwise end up uh, just in the trash so that it is being recycled. But you found an issue um, as you were walking the jetty, you saw the birds with the hooks in their mouth or, um, you know, and they're wrapped around their foot or their head or something like that. And you kind of put two and two together because you saw that they were, um, very often on the jetty. So you decided, I'm going to take a walk and um, tell us what you found out there. Um, well, I mean, the, the saddest thing I found was a baby in badly entangled deceased pelican um, just so wrapped up in fishing line. And I've seen several other birds um, during our cleanups that, that, you know, had gotten entangled on that jetty and, you know, that that was it for them yeah uh, yeah so for the for the recreational fishing person um they may not be aware sometimes you know your line gets snagged and you just can't pull it in so you just cut it and then at some point it it works its way loose from wherever it was originally snagged and now it's loosened about or perhaps you know they're fishing and a pelican loves to take the bait off the end of a hook um and and so there's just this it's never intentional but it is um we call that bycatch and that's when an animal that wasn't intended to be captured um does get um does get injured or um, killed in the process. And so Gary, you've been going out there. So there was no walk the jetty and clean up the fishing line club that you joined. You just saw a problem and you said, I'm gonna take care of this problem. Yeah, and I did it by myself for the first year um, and decided, hey, let me expand this because however many times I was able to get out there, it just it was never enough, you know, and the more you can clean it up, the better for the birds and the less entanglement. So um, I teamed up, teamed up with another nonprofit here called Stand Up to Trash. And um, they helped me develop a volunteer list um, by networking with them. And they have a huge uh, group of volunteers that clean up trash around the harbor, amazing group. So, uh, yeah, so it's just kind of grown from there. And to your point earlier, Giselle, this is why it's so important to never feed a wild animal. So when those, if you're fishing, whether it's on a jetty, on land, you'll see a bird come up and it seems so cute to throw them some fish. That's what teaches them to grab fish off hooks. Right. And that's honestly, that there's probably way more entanglements for birds going for people fishing and their bait on their hook. Um, that's probably more of a problem than the discarded jetty. Uh, line yeah uh, super important no matter how good it feels to feed a wild animal all it's going to do is teach them behavior that will get them in real trouble and 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 killed yeah 
Yeah, thank you for that. So um, your uh, encouragement to somebody who's sitting at home right now watching this, uh, hey, wow, that's so cool. Um, wh what, 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 what one or two tips would you give someone to get involved? You know, all you have to do is make it a priority. Once you see a problem, first you have to look, keep your eyes open. Um, a lot of us are on autopilot. I see a lot of people um, pass by an injured bird um, next to the next to the harbor, and it just someday someday seems like I'm the only one that's looking for it. So first, you have to look for it. You have to be aware of your surroundings, and that the problem will present itself. And you can easily find a solution, but first you have to see the problem. So just being more aware of what's out there. Um, and fishing line is everywhere. Um, and not everyone has the uh, amazing recycling tubes that Dana Point has. So yeah. anytime you're near the ocean, chances are there's going to be an entangled bird somewhere. So at the very least, you can call your local animal control, kind of stay with that bird until they come out and uh, try to catch it. I love so that. That's great. Aware and you'll see what needs to be. What sure. needs to be. Yeah. And as, and as we do pay attention more and more, you start to learn what is normal behavior for animals oh. and what is, uh, that doesn't look right. Something about the way that that animal's moving is not normal. And of course, that's one of the things that we do when we're out watching whales. Gary uh, is um, training to be a NOAA um, whale disentanglement responder and um, so we're really proud of him, as well as I think about eight or nine other members of our team who either are responders already or uh, want to be responders. Gary, you've taken part in a whale disentanglement. Um, what was that like? Yeah, I, I, I've been fortunate to, to be kind of a support vessel um, on two of them, actually, um, thanks to Captain Dave's uh, allowing us or making it a priority to use our boats to do whatever we can to help these animals. Um, so I took out Captain Dave boats both times, one with uh, you, Giselle, and Captain Dave. And um, witnessing, talking about heroes, the heroes are those people on the whale disentanglement teams. I, I'm getting goosebumps remembering it now. They're mega heroes and they're risking their lives to yeah. try to entangle this giant animal who is scared and um, thrashing around and um, the level of training these guys go through, even though it's just a volunteer basis, they're experts at what they do. And, you know, we witnessed a complete disentanglement yeah. uh, in both cases, which is, it's not easy to do and it doesn't always happen. You know, they get as much line off as they can. And then we just hope the rest uh, can kind of work itself out. But it was the most incredible sight I've ever seen. Uh, absolutely incredible. People risking their lives for no money, just with their big hearts, uh, yeah. kind of righting the wrong, you know, of us uh, creating all this trash this entanglement issues out there. Yep. It's a beautiful thing. And we're blessed to have been able to do it so often. It's hard when we aren't successful, but um, you're not going to know until you try. And you so have we, to try. We, 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 we try. Um, one last question. I love to ask everybody this. So Gary, when you look back on your life, what was the first time you remember having a connection with some animal or place in the wild and thinking, Oh my gosh. Do you remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. So <laughs> my parents divorced when I was five and my mom, you know, was in night school getting her PhD at a full-time job. Um, she was also an animal rescuer. Um, so I was, so I kept my connection with my world at a young age um, from all of the animals in our house. I had pet rats, hamsters, um, dogs, cats, uh, animal circus wallpaper, and <laughs> too uh, deep on it, but they saved me when I was a little kid. Um, I needed to stay connected, and the animals and the love, unconditional love um, between myself and these animals kept me connected, and I just feel like I owe them everything. 
and uh, I give up just about I will give up anything to do my best to save I know any you will. yeah it's a beautiful yeah. thing it's uh yeah. it's such a, a gift to have you on the team and nothing makes me happier than having you say hey I'm <laughs> I'm on my way back in I just saw a bird can I go back out and get yeah. it yes of course go 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 I mean it's a it's a a privilege to have you want to do what you do and have you be on the team so thank you for everything that you do really appreciate it and uh we'll see you out there all right and thanks to you for supporting um helping those animals uh using the company boats it's just incredible and i don't know of another company that um is so dedicated to the animals so thank you you're welcome thanks gary so hi everyone and uh this guest here uh is jess wright uh jessica wright she is uh one of our captain dave's uh first mates and naturalists and jess brings uh, an incredible amount of enthusiasm and wisdom and skill to our team she's also um a blog writer for us she's very good at that and we appreciate everything that you do for us jess thank you um you you have been with us now a little over two years, right? Almost, around, two, years, almost yeah. two years. And um, I wanted to, I invited you to be on here to be a, kind of a, of a spokesperson for being an eco hero because you do such a great job of that, um, not just on the boats, but off the boats. And that's what I want to talk to because not everyone can be a first mate um, mm -hmm. with Captain Dave's. But they can be eco heroes on their own in their oh. own lives, wherever they are, whatever they're doing. And so I wanted to welcome you and to invite you to share a little bit about your experience living in New Zealand. Oh, well, thank you, Giselle, for that lovely introduction. Uh, yes, I did have the pleasure of living in New Zealand. I moved there in 2000. 15. I stayed there till just through the half of the year of 2019. So about um, four years. And it was an incredible experience. I moved there uh, because my husband had a job opportunity. And to be honest with you, when we first made the decision to go, it was not an easy decision. It was something that uh, we had to really think about. Our kids were very networked. They were young. Uh, my son was only five. My daughter was seven. And we just didn't know if that was the right time to be doing such a big move out of country and not having any family support. But we did it uh, with the belief that there's a bigger path for what we're supposed to be doing and we should just follow it. So we did it. And uh, from the moment we arrived, we knew it was the right place for us to be. Uh, we were greeted by wonderful people. And it was one of those situations where the next thing we knew, things just kept falling into our lap and we didn't exactly understand how or why. Uh, one of the most important things that I did there was I had the opportunity to work with little blue penguins. And a lot of people know them as fairy penguins. Uh, they're very small. They only get to be about 14 inches in height and they only weigh two to three pounds. And they only live in the Southern hemisphere. So they are a spectacular little penguin. And what happens is they are nocturnal animals. And if you find one on the beach or you see one of them swimming in shallow waters during the day, we can kind of anticipate that they have been injured in some kind of way, possibly they're sick. Um, they might be malnourished in some sort of capacity. And so one day I was walking along the beach and I saw a little penguin and I saw a group of people that were surrounding these tide pools. And I, of course, was interested. I went over and checked it out. And I kind of explained a little bit of my background to it, what I felt was the head person that was heading things up. And um, we had that opportunity to start talking. And next thing, one thing led to another. And all of a sudden, I was volunteering at this aviary wildlife center. Um, what that It was just like one of those things I had no idea that I was going to be doing. And, it, and New Zealand just kind of presented this opportunity to us. So I ended up doing that for the length of the time that I was there. And it was an incredible experience because we got to the point of once we knew what to do with the birds, I, I don't really have an aviary background per se, um, although I do love the marine sciences, I didn't specifically have an ornithology focus. And so um, we ended up gaining a lot of insight, did some training, and next thing you know, the people that were in charge of the group needed to go on vacation and they just put me in charge. So <laughs> it was 
a little bit wild to be honest but um they taught us what to do and what we would do is we would go to the sanctuary we'd pick up the penguins we'd literally put them in a like a plastic picnic basket that had open and closed closures. And they're really tiny. So we'd put maybe five or six in at a time. There was a herding dog named Missy and I'd bring her in the car with me along with a couple large nets. And we'd take them down to the tide pools to swim in open tide pools so that they had their own natural environment to kind of rehabilitate themselves in. And then once they were strong enough to be re-released, if they were able to be re-released, we would take them about 30 to 60 miles out and re-release them. Wow. So, yeah, it was an incredible experience. And it wasn't something that I just got to do on my own. I would say the, the coolest part about it was my kids came along with me for every step of the journey. So part of uh, being able to rehabilitate penguins in their own natural environment is to wake up when the tides are low and maybe stay up until the tides are low. So even though my kids were little, we'd take them down to the tide pools four in the morning, 11 o'clock at night, whatever it meant. And sometimes that would mean that we'd get up for school at four o'clock in the morning, watch the sunrise, take the penguins. We'd call them swimming the penguins. Um, and we'd swim the penguins and then they'd come home and everybody would take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So steps to becoming an eco-hero. Mm. I was making some notes. So the first one is to be aware. You were out there, you saw something happening. You're like, what's going on? And you got involved. And the second thing is you were willing to be um, trainable. So you were, you were willing to learn. And that's also very important. The third thing is you were willing to give your time and get stretched. Not everyone wants to get out of bed at four in the morning yeah. and go swim a penguin. I don't but know that I like, wanted to do that. That sounds really fun, but not everyone <laughs> wants to do that. So you were willing to be inconvenienced. And um, I was just, uh, you know, Dave has said this before, what we don't know um, and sometimes love, we don't care to protect. So once we establish a connection um, with animals, and maybe it's, you know, through what we've read or watched on TV or, or you know, Instagram awesome. or something, um, then we can, we know these animals better, we care more and we can take steps. So you, um, you became, you became educated and you were willing to be inconvenienced mm -hmm. for these animals. So as a mom, um, uh, two beautiful children, Nora and Henry, um, very, very eco-conscious uh, kiddos. So tell me uh, one or two tips that you would give for moms to get their kiddos involved. Well, I think the easiest step, especially with technology today, is like you said, there's things available that are on Instagram, um, different platforms, especially with young, very young children. If you can get them in early, uh, there's so much programming that's available, uh, both with iPads and if you don't are or if you're not really interested in using technology, there are so many different kids magazines like National Geographic Kids and even the Highlands magazine. Those were gifts that were given to our children when they were little. And that's just a really approachable, easy way to get them to connect and see things. Uh, and also kind of read about the importance of seeing animals in their own natural environment. And then it starts to establish the connection of why it's important to protect, protect them. I love this as you're talking, I'm thinking next blog. Oh, right. I, yeah. Told me same. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, just um, one more thing. Tell yeah. me now that you're here uh, in the U.S., where besides Captain Dave's, um, do you have time to still do some volunteer stuff or are you are you staying kind of in the cetacean community? What would you recommend if there was one place people could perhaps... Um, check out as a place to volunteer or learn what would you where would you send them well if you're looking for more of a worldwide organization i think the worldwide worldwide wildlife federation is a great place to start i think national geographic is a great place to start reef is an amazing company if you want to just log into those websites you can get tons of information anywhere that you are locally and globally uh, but if you are looking for things in the local areas of our community you can absolutely get involved in the orange county area as well um, you can look at your local chamber of commerce and uh, i know at captain dave's when we take people on a trip. I am the first person to let everybody know all of the fun things you can do in our area, like up at the headlands, there's a wonderful natural conservatory center you can visit there as well. And volunteer at. 
You can volunteer there. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Jess. I really appreciate your time today and uh, we'll see you out on the water. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll see you guys soon. Book a trip. <laughs> thank you. Bye. All right. So now we have Hannah Rich. Hannah is one of our first mates, marine naturalist, um, a captain on her way to being a captain. And uh, we love that, support that. And Hannah is also one of our eco heroes. So hi, Hannah. Hello. Hannah's thanks been with us. Me. What's that? I said, thanks for having me. I'm happy to have you here. <laughs> Hannah has been with us almost four years, uh, going on four years uh, this month. And um, the reason I I consider you to be an eco hero, besides the fact that you're out there on the water with us a number of days every week, you're also a mom of a four, beautiful four-year-old and you do something else in your spare time. I don't know where spare time comes from, when you're a mom of a four-year-old and you're out on the water as much as you are. So tell everybody, what do you do in your spare time? Yes. Yeah, so um, I am a volunteer as well as a board member um, with the American Cetacean Society, which is a NGO that's found worldwide. There's a number of, of uh, chapters up and down the West Coast here and uh, many in Southern California as well. So um, basically we exist to educate the public and engage with the public about um, cetaceans, which is just a fancy word for dolphins, whales, and porpoises. Um, we also chat with people about pinnipeds, so our sea lions and seals and any other um, you know, relevant uh, animals that might be in our area that coexist amongst uh, the same you know area that we might find dolphins and whales be it sunfish or you know sea otters all those fun things um so that is what i've been doing for almost um let's see seven or so years and that's how i got my start as a naturalist which is one of the roles that i do on our whale watch boats uh, where i work here at captain dave so it's been an amazing experience um, i've learned so much about cetaceans through american cetacean society and we have such an amazing opportunity in this program to engage with the public. So a lot of our outreach happens at, um, you know, festivals like Festival of Whales that we have here in Dana Point every year. Um, maybe some STEM events. Uh, there's a popular one that happens here at our OC Fairgrounds uh, where we engage with people of all ages and uh, all backgrounds, be it kids, adults. Um, and we have a wide, you know, a very diverse group of volunteers that uh, do this with us. And so it's a great program. We get to set up a table, you know, somewhere at one of these events and just talk to people about dolphins and whales. Uh, we talk with them a lot about the issues that cetaceans are facing, uh, you know, with entanglement, uh, ship strikes, uh, microplastics in the ocean, uh, a changing environment, all, all sorts of topics. So we have a really unique opportunity to uh, chat with the public. A lot of people who have never seen a dolphin or whale before. We do some stuff with at-risk schools um, and things like that. So it's it's a great, great thing that I've, I've gotten to be a part of it. Yeah, you're right, Sel. It's hard to find the time to do it as a working mom. Uh, but somehow I've made it work over the years. Yes, you <laughs> uh, have. Current, yeah, one of our things we're most proud of that I have gotten to really become more of a part of is we do a naturalist certification course. So this is for anybody that just has an interest in dolphins and whales. We do a 10 week course and uh, you learn everything you need to know about uh, Southern California's cetaceans and you get a certificate at the end if you pass our final test. And that enables you to volunteer on some of our local whale watching boats to uh, be like a docent, you know, at maybe some of our local, um, you know, outreach areas like be it at the tide pools or maybe a, um, the conservation area here in Dana Point, like the headlands. It's just a great certificate to have if this is something that interests you and you want to kind of enter uh, into this area of interest. So I love that. I love that you do that. You've been very instrumental in helping us uh, with educational materials over the years, um, to, you know, for curriculum, schools, um, and then also putting together some of the educational interactive uh, games that we offer up at the dolphin deck when people are checking in and, you know, waiting for the captain to come and get them. There's some really cool stuff up there that you've been responsible for putting together, which I greatly appreciate. Um, so uh, 
I, well, you're a mom. So what do you do or what would you recommend that people do to um, get their kiddos uh, aware and interested? Yeah. So, um, you know, if, if you do live by the ocean, you have a great opportunity to um, check out the amazing wildlife we have in our tide pools or just at the beach. Um, you know, obviously, if you can go whale watching, that's amazing. I realize not everyone has the resources um, for that or maybe lives in proximity to that. So, you know, something I do with my daughter that we did a lot during um, COVID was just go for neighborhood walks. And everything's tied to the ocean. Every gutter in your neighborhood that maybe has trash sitting in it, every piece of plastic you find at the park when you take your kids, I mean, that is stuff that could end up in the ocean. So um, as a parent, you know, I have an important job to teach my daughter about her place in the world and how humans are, you know, our gift, beautiful planet. So um, as a mom, it's important to me to show my daughter all the amazing creatures around us, be it on the ocean or just even in our neighborhood when it comes to backyard birds and bugs and uh, snails. I mean, she's a huge snail fan. <laughs> She'd right. have an army of snails if she had her choice. So <laughs> we love to do that, that kind of stuff. That's always been super important to me. <laughs> and to my it. husband, we, yeah. we try a lot of neighborhood such, and we pick up trash, you know, I'm trying to teach her to be an eco hero in that way. If we see trash, um, to put it in the proper, um, waste, either trash can or recycling or what, what it may be. So I love that. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for that great tip. I have one last question. So um, I always think that this kind of a passion gets, you know, Dave always says that you don't really care to protect something until you've, you know it, and then you love it. And so when did your first experience or connection with something in the wild or an animal or something like that happen? Do you remember that when you were growing up? Um, you know, as a kid, I grew up here in Southern California and, um, my dad was a big waterman, um, but more so with rivers and he was a big fly fisherman. So I grew up understanding how that was all connected. He really did a good job of educating me when I was a kid of how our rivers connect to the ocean and how it's important to keep rivers healthy. And then I got to the opportunity to go whale watching as a kid um, through, you know, our school here, because a lot of the schools do field trips and stuff. And I got to see dolphins and whales and got to see how these things are all connected. And that was just really fascinating to me. And um, it's, it's just such a special thing. And, you know, as a kid, the first time seeing a whale, <laughs> you just don't, you see them on TV and you see them in videos, but until you see them with your own eyes in the wild, just it's it's hard to explain it. Yeah. And I, I just remember being really emotional about it and just feeling really like <laughs> to see such an amazing animal. And, uh, you know, they they're just absolutely magnificent. And so that's really kind of what sparked my interest at first. And I grew up surfing and um, just like I do with my daughter, we spent a lot of time on the beach, you know, picking up trash. And my dad really did a good job of teaching my brother and I how important that was to take care of our planet. So that's always kind of been a value of mine since I was a kid that I now want to pass on uh, to my daughter. I love that. I think you're doing an amazing job at it. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for everything you do for uh, the environment and uh, for Captain Daves. We really appreciate you. Thank you. All right. We'll see you out on the water. Sounds great. See you out there.